Okay, I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier chair here at CSIS. I'm really uh, glad that all of you have come out um, for this conversation we're having about SDG 9. <clears throat> and um, I think it, we've done a series of these. Uh, it's totally thankless to do, a, we're doing all 17 of these SDGs. We, I think we're on number eight or nine, or maybe we're on number 10. We couldn't do this without our friends at Chevron. They have been so great. Um, because there are not a lot of funders that are willing to actually fund this stuff. There's lots of people who emote about this or say they care about this, but then when I say we need sponsors, there aren't a lot of folks that are willing to sponsor this. So Chevron has been, have been a really stand-up partner and a stand-up organization and have been willing to help us do this consistently. And they've been a great long-term partner. So we're talking about SDG 9, which is about industrialization and infrastructure. Uh, and innovation. Uh, we have several panelists. My fourth panelist got sick this morning. She's fine. She just had a stomach bug, but she just couldn't be with us today. I'm very I'm sad to say that Eno Avon couldn't be with us. So we've got some great panelists to help us unpack this really interesting set of issues. Um, and so I'm going to ask my panelists to come on up. Thank you. Okay, so I've got, I'm going to start with my friend Peter Raymond. Peter was a driving force behind a bipartisan task force that we did on uh, global infrastructure called the Higher Road and uh, what really helped us uh, shape it. He's a, an affiliate here at CSIS, um, has worked in the infrastructure sector for a very long time. Um, and uh, so Peter, thanks for helping us and for being with us today. Um, could you, when you think about, you know, when you saw that there was an, a, a sustainable development goal on infrastructure and innovation and industry, what was your reaction to that? And what are some of the, what are some of the um, things that are coming down the pike on, on, on infrastructure? Thanks, Dan. My pleasure to be here today and to be with such a distinguished panel. Um, uh, infrastructure, I think most people know by now, is really fundamental to economic development and growth. Uh, you've probably seen the reports from the World Bank, the IMF, and others that a dollar well spent in infrastructure yields about a $3 return to GDP. So getting infrastructure right is really important. And linking that with industrialization, I think, is, is really key as well. And, and I was pleased to see when the SDGs came out that they put infrastructure, industrialization, and innovation together because they really are tied together in a very fundamental way. Um, and you get those GDP impacts not just because you have a nice bridge, but because you can actually improve commerce and transportation and logistics and supply chains as a result of the bridges and the ports and the airports that you put in place um, in a country. One of the interesting things, Dan, you and I have spent some time talking about is the impact of technology on infrastructure. And, and like so many other industries, technology is fundamentally disrupting the infrastructure industry uh, around the world. And if, if you indulge me for just please, a moment, please. <laughs> um, there are just, I think there are three things you need to look at with respect to technology and innovation in infrastructure, um, because these are the three big trends that the way I see them anyway. One is the way in which technology is improving the accuracy and the speed um, with which we can deliver infrastructure projects effectively, and that is thereby reducing cost and risk. So you think about all the technologies from sensors to, to um, augmented reality to drones, all of these technologies when deployed effectively are reducing the cost and increasing the speed of delivery of infrastructure projects fairly dramatically, in some cases by up to 30 or 40 percent from a cost reduction standpoint. So that's a really important trend, and I think it's very beneficial to countries around the world, particularly developing economies. But you do need the technology infrastructure in place to enable those technologies um, to actually deliver those results. The second area, and I think it's one that's not ha has not yet been fully focused on, is how technology is disrupting traditional business models. 
for infrastructure. So if we think about um, the way in which infrastructure used to be delivered on a, let's say, a public-private partnership basis, a project finance basis, where you have a power plant, a merchant power plant that's going to deliver power over 30 years, you get a 30-year bond um, and financing associated with that. You have a power purchase agreement um, that locks in and secures kind of the payment stream for that. In today's world, where the power sector is being disrupted by distrib distributed generation, uh, solar and renewable power um, assets, by uh, conservancy measures, et cetera, those business models are getting disrupted. And, and those players who are entering the market with the disruptive business models are more likely to prevail going forward. But it does create a dilemma in terms of how you design and finance infrastructure projects, particularly in emerging economies. And just one more, Dan, and then I'll no, give please. up the microphone. Um, the third area is the new business models that are emerging. Um, we think we talk a lot now about 5G and the impact of 5G and potentially autonomous vehicles, et cetera. But when you look at the digitization that is happening around the world, and not just in the United States or in China, but in many emerging economies as well, the business models that are emerging around streetlight provision and all the technologies you can put on streetlights and the, and the revenue streams that can be generated from those new technologies. These are creating whole new revenue streams and new potentials for, um, for investment in infrastructure in developing economies as well. So, so I think the SDG goal of infrastructure, industry, and innovation is a very well closely knit package of activities that um, are really important to the growth and development of uh, developing economies and to the emerged economies as well. Thank you, Peter. That's really great. Uh, well, I, while I have you, I do, I, I always like talking about infrastructure because you always enlighten me. There's, the sustainable development goals are not just about the developing world, they're also relevant to the United States. And so one of the things we've been I think we're, our Global Development Forum in April <clears throat> will talk about SDGs at home and abroad or economic growth at home and abroad. There's a lot of discussion in this country about the infrastructure gap in this country. Could you just talk a little bit about what some of the steps the U.S. government could take to close the infrastructure gap uh, on the one hand? And then <clears throat> could you talk separately? You were part, as I mentioned earlier, you were part of the task force on global infrastructure. What are some easy steps we could do to close the infrastructure gap in developing countries? Great. Um, how many hours do I have, we Dan? Three. <laughs> right. Um, so uh, the U.S. used to be a world leader in infrastructure. And um, uh, we are less so now today. And you can read any number of reports that show the kind of incremental cost of the deteriorating infrastructure in the United States to U.S. productivity, to our trade uh, growth and balances, um, and to you know, livelihoods of our, of our people. Um, there are a number of things that can be done, and I will say uh, it was, I guess, two years ago now that uh, the current administration released uh, its infrastructure plan. Now, that didn't really go anywhere uh, from a legislative standpoint, but many of the principles in that plan, Dan, were actually very good from a standpoint of let's reduce um, the, the um, bureaucratic processes, not, not take away the essential environmental reviews, the essential human um, and social impact reviews, but let's make it more streamlined. Let's not have five or six different agencies all doing parallel reviews on the same things. Another idea in that plan was let's bring the private sector more actively into the development of infrastructure in the United States. And when you look around the world at the role of the private sector in investment in infrastructure, in roads and bridges and airports and other sorts of things, the US, frankly, lags. South Africa, it lags the UK, it lags Canada, and many other countries, because we just, we have um, a lot of complicated processes which inhibit real effective private sector investment and growth um, in infrastructure in the US. Now, on top of those kind of measures, we do need more funding from a, a national or federal level 
into infrastructure, particularly in, into rural infrastructure, rural broadband and, and uh, rural services uh, in the United States. And, and those are things that are unlikely to be closed effectively by private capital. So I would say it's a combination of things, right? It's a combination of streamlining certain processes without sacrificing the quality. It's about attracting private investment and it's about bringing public money to where it's needed. Those are the things I think in the US that we need right. to do. How about, how about internationally from the report or just, is, yeah. is it similar in internationally or, you know, thinking about the report we did or, or thinking about the issues, let's say in developing countries, is it, it's, it's, it's a slightly different mix, I would assume. Yeah, uh, well, many of the same characteristics apply in developing economies, but uh, the, the gap, we, you talked about the infrastructure gap in developing economies, is something like $27 trillion is needed just to maintain the pace of economic growth that we've had over the past 10 years, right? And, and so that's an awful lot of money. And in, in, public sector does not have those kinds of resources, um, but the private sector does. So it, there are things that you can do to improve project preparation and de-risking projects in the emerging economies that will enhance the attractiveness of them for private capital. Now, private capital is not going to solve all the problems. You do need public capital as well. But if you can take some of the steps that were laid out in the report um, about enhancing um, uh, risk mitigation instruments, uh, guarantees, first loss guarantee, uh, you know, we can get into some of the details of these we did, things. We did a follow-on report just on guarantees that multilateral development banks and the DFIs that, that Romina Bandura wrote that when you read that report, you should also read the guarantees report that we did about six months later that um, I'll share with you. I'm not sure I've shared it with you since, but yeah. it's a must read. Clear your calendar. Don't make it a Netflix <laughs> night. Read, read the guarantees report. But that is so important, right, to bringing private capital to these projects. And, and by the way, there's a lot of demand not only in these countries, but on the part of multinational corporations, whether they're U.S.-based, European-based, Asian-based, they are looking to develop infrastructure or have developed infrastructure in emerging economies so they can improve their supply chains. So there's a lot of interest in this area. We just need to move some of the bottlenecks out of the way. But $27 trillion is a big gap to close. It's going to take a lot of different actions to be able to come close to closing that. Great. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Karin, thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, you are the um, program manager for the 2030 Water Resources Group at the World Bank. You've had a really interesting career. You've been in the, the water world, if I can describe it that way, for tw at least 20 years. And it's kind of the intersection of the environment and natural resources and water. Um, I wanted to have a water, a person to speak about water, because when I think about infrastructure, one of the components of infrastructure is water. Now, there there are other this, so I wanted to specifically talk about water in the context of infrastructure. So I, I really appreciate you, you being with us today. So I, could you start with um, the issue of um, is, is water a human right and should people to pay for water? Because I think that, that you start with that and then I think a lot of things trickle down, sorry, trickle down from there. But so Karin, could you start with that and then let's talk about some of the, some of the innovations and some of the infrastructure needs that are needed for water. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, and thank you for having me here with this, this panel. Um, so in terms of the issue on water, um, there actually, to go directly to your question, um, um, is there has, was a high-level panel on water that included a number of governments that convened together um, a number of years ago, actually a few years ago, post actually adoption of the SDG, and as particularly SDG 6 on water. And actually I was showing earlier, this is my SDG 6 on water ban. They have them for all 17 SDGs. SDGs, if you'd like to have all 17 of them. Um, I have also 17 on partnerships, which actually I'll come back to later. Um, but when the issue around um, water is with the high-level panel really came down to the context of what they confirmed as the Bellagio principles. And the Bellagio principles really are focused around valuing water. 
Um, pricing water, yes, is part of that, but um, valuing water is much more complex than that. It brings in principles in terms of water. When we look at water within our lives and society, society Water has a role in terms of economics, of course, but also social and environmental concerns. So the Bellagio principles came up with a number of principles that really look at focusing on countries on how to embed the value of water within decision-making processes. I will say um, some of the governments, like the Bangladesh government was actually part of this high-level panel on water, and the Bangladesh government, um, who's actually one of our um, platform partners for the 2030 Water Resources Group under the multi-stakeholder platform we have established in, in Bangladesh under the government there um, is actually taking this forward in terms of saying, okay, how do we take principles? Because many times principles are created at the higher level, but how do we then embed them into government processes and decision-making processes? So in Bangladesh, actually within the multi-stakeholder platform that we support there, the government has created a um, committee that is focused very much on valuing water. And that's looking at the full um, costs of water and how to embed that into processes. And for that, it's also, I mentioned government, but it's very much the private sector. Um, following on your points, um, the private sector has, is very much taking seriously this issue. And particularly in Bangladesh, a number of the companies, even textile companies, who are trying to see how they can take this issue of valuing water, how can they take SDG 6, or and even the other SDGs, and embed them into their own operations. Um, whether that's kind of setting broader corporate principles, but then also within their supply chains, which is often the most difficult issue to, to tackle. So in, I think this issue has, was really well addressed um, with us high-level panel on water on this, this context of valuing water, um, and now to see how can then we take it to that next level to operationalize that within the countries, I think, is really critical. Great. Right. Okay. So, so tell me about, talk about some new models for financing water infrastructure. You've talked about some of the principles. And can you also talk about some of the promising technologies? Are there, is there some game changer like there is, there was with cell phones that changed the world. Is there something that's the equivalent of cell phone telephony for Africa for water infrastructure? Well, everyone's looking for that. So if you come up with one, let us know. Um, there's no silver bullet, right? I mean, water is a very complex issue. We need water for municipal purposes. We need it for industrial purposes. We need it for agricultural purposes. Most water actually goes to agriculture. 70 to 80 percent of water goes to agriculture. So there's no one particular solution that's going to be able to tackle all of those areas. But I do think that um, the SDG certainly for us has seemed to open that space of how can we drive innovation innovations at scale. The water sector, I will be honest, is probably the one of the laggards when it comes to innovation. Um, and now there is a big push to say, how can we move this forward? Um, but again, as I mentioned, it's very complex if you're looking at it across all the different water uses. It was interesting in New York. I was in New York when the SDGs were being adopted, and it was actually the first time in all UN processes that I had been a party to or involved in or participating in where the private sector was mentioned. Um, almost every government mentioned we need the private sector, we need the private sector to come in and bring innovations. And so I think this kind of marriage with the SDGs of governments more seeing the opportunity to work with government, with private sector and civil society is opening that space to drive innovations in a way that we haven't necessarily seen before. But again, there's no one solution. So one of the things, for example, some of the things that we're working on as 2030 Water Resources Group in the 14 countries um, with the governments and private sector companies and civil society organizations we're working with, a few of them, for example, around wastewater treatment and reuse, right? Um, most tr wastewater is actually is dumped out, right, and is not treated and does not come back into the system. And so now there's more thinking of can we promote circular economies where we treat water and wasted water and bring it back into the system. So the idea with this approach that we're actually developing, the government in Maharashtra is leading on this under the platform, the multi-stakeholder platform there, is the idea is can you create a market-based approach for trading of treated wastewater. And it would be across different industrial uses, it would be across different economic zones, um, ultimately perhaps even for agricultural purposes. Um, but the idea is bringing in a market-based approach to combine with wastewater treatment in a new paradigm of promoting, looking at how we can reduce um, demands on water. So uh, we did a report a number of 10 years ago that looked at the global supply demand gap on water, and it's for, it will be 40%. 
mm -hmm. um, gap. So we have a big gap. Um, it varies within countries, but even yesterday we were discussing Latin America where you often think of South America has abundance of water. But even there, there's a major lack of infrastructure and there's also major issues. Sao Paulo had a drought, of course. Other countries are experiencing floods. And so it's how do we manage across these different um, uses. So, uh, the idea is to how to bring in different solutions, but there's not one big solution, right, when it comes to water. So this idea with these wastewater reuse certificate trading program, we've actually did a hackathon um, last year where we said, how can we bring in blockchain technology to tamper-proof these approaches um, in creating these certificates. So it's an evolving process, um, one that could then move into the agriculture sector and so forth. But I just want everybody to keep in mind that you know there is no one perfect solution. We're using the 2030 WRG multi-stakeholder platforms as a safe space to test innovations because that's the issue of how can we test them in a safe space, bring in government, private sector, civil society to work on it together. And then if something is promising, then, then how do we scale it? Well, could you just, 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 Karen, just tell me about one or two other promising innovations because this, the, these have been particularly intractable. If you look at, like you said, I think there've been, if you look at the medical breakthroughs in the last 20 years, there's been incredible progress in global health. You could argue that, in, even in basic education in the last 30 years, there's been significant progress. But some of these water rate, whether it's <clears throat> drinkable water or sewage systems or agricultural water, uh, there, we, we, there's been some progress, but it's been slower. So tell me about a couple of other things that you're optimistic about so that people leave here feeling like it's it's not all you know there, there's more than just we're just we're we're, we're gonna we're gonna because I th I know there are some of the whether it's blockchain or whether it's cell phone telephony or sensors or new forms of micropayments it seems to me that kind of these combination of new technologies and innovations are going to allow us to look at water differently. Is that, do you agree with that? I, I would definitely agree with that. I would definitely agree with that. I think there are different approaches, like for example, AI is now moving forward in terms of broader watershed mapping, mm. of how can you map watersheds, because part of our challenge with water is just understanding water and the dynamics of water. It is very complex, um, and especially when you have so many uses for water, understanding the hydrological cycle and how it works through, and then how do you deal with use, different uses and allocations of water. So there's definitely, I would say, kind of that broad broader area around AI um, um, or different technologies that are kind of at that mapping scale so we can better understand the systems. Groundwater, for example, is one of those, I would say, it's, maybe I could say it's like Sorry, what's groundwater? So groundwater, all water that's below our ground in terms of aquifers. So we have surface water and then we have, which is either in rivers or lakes, and then we have groundwater, which is in aquifer systems. And most countries, um, there's some countries in the world that do not depend on groundwater systems, but most countries of the world depend on groundwater systems um, for different purposes, either municipal, agricultural, or industrial. And part of the challenge has been we don't have a complete understanding of these groundwater systems. So in many respects, we're depleting these groundwater aquifers before we're even able to recharge them, which is going to have very serious implications for us. Um, and there is, I mean, you obviously heard of day zero in Cape Town um, across the news. Remind folks what okay. that was about. So day zero in Cape Town was when the city was coming up against the wall in terms of limiting water use because there was basically an urgency of lack of water. Um, and you know they did not have the, the rainfall patterns and so forth that are expected. We're seeing bigger changes in variability. Um, and so actually, um, you know, the city came to say, well, what are we going to do about this? Um, and how do we work with government, private sector across all the different water users to put in restrictions? So there were restrictions that were serious restrictions that were put in place. Um, and there have been restrictions in other places across the globe. But now there's a, I think, I can't even remember the list now of how many cities are now being projected to be the next day zero cities. Um, Lima, Peru is on there. Many others are on there. Chennai actually has been in the news. More in terms than a dozen? Of, more than a dozen. Um, certainly 20 plus. Um, and so cities are really now looking to say, well, how do we manage these issues and innovate for this and also partner across all of the different stakeholders that are needed? Water is not an issue that one institution will solve on its own in terms of the challenges. It really requires SDG 17, if I can bring that in, which is around partnerships. Okay, remember, I can hardly keep the Ten Commandments straight. So when you start throwing numbers around on the SDGs, we got to all you know, work with me here. So 
Remind when you say SDG 70, SDG what does that mean? SDG 17 is around partnerships, and the okay. idea is that collaboration is needed to accomplish any of the other SDGs, and certainly for water, we would say very much so. So on this issue, just coming back to innovation, so this issue with cities, so we actually have joined a, a coalition with a number of companies, Procter & Gamble and a few others, um, and which, which was launched in Davos at the World Economic Forum, which is focusing on how can, in cities, um, People live on 50 liters of water a day, but make it feel like 500 liters of water a day, right? So the idea is you're putting in this goal, saying, okay, can we live on 50 liters of water a day, and how can we innovate around that? So I, I, I would- Does that mean we're gonna have to flush toilets six times and have like those, those little weak shower heads? Is that what we're talking I about? I don't, hopefully not the I don't weak wanna be condemned heads. that I miss my <laughs> strong showers. Um, no, but we certainly don't want to undermine the comforts um, for people, but um, certainly we need to face the fact that we have these stresses and on water systems. And so I keep the door open on innovations. Um, we're working within the coalition to pick some pilot cities where we could then see how can we innovate across this and bring new technologies. There are other ones I haven't mentioned, like IoT metering, for example, for dealing with pollution. What's IoT metering? So Internet of Things that um, are used in terms of, in this case, for detecting pollution. Um, I mentioned groundwater. Another big issue in water is water quality. Um, there's the amount of water we need, which is, you know, water quantity, but water quality, um, whether it's um, contaminants from agriculture or industrial purposes and so forth, or even municipal purposes. So our pollution, the World Bank just released a report um, last year on water quality and really the crisis that we have looming ahead for us. And so the idea is also, can we tackle some of these water quality issues? So it's not, I don't want to be negative, it sounds like a lot in the water space, but also to understand that institutions are really putting their heads to thinking how can we tackle these issues. Um, but it will require looking at water at multiple sectors, at multiple levels, and certainly across stakeholders working together. Karin, let, one last thing. So that water is not just a problem in developing countries, it's a problem in the United States. So there, just last week, <clears throat> there was some news about California. California has ongoing and persistent challenges around water, and there's different stakeholder interests in water. And if you compare, so wa water in California is a salient issue. It's also a salient issue in China. It's a salient issue in Egypt. So could you just talk about, could you just spend, it just for, in layperson's terms, could you explain what are the, what are the issues in front of us for water in California? If you could just talk a little bit about that, if you know. I'm not the that. best person to speak on that because our focus is really on developing countries. That's a that's a good um, answer. That's so. a good, that's a good World Bank answer. <laughs> yeah. But 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 why don't you? So what what is that about? Is that is that a is that a conflict between the ur rural agriculture interest and urban? residential interests, is that what that is? Well, I would say the thing is, it's across the board. I mean, even in the 14 countries where we have 2030 Water Resource Group platforms, you know, Asia, Africa, Latin America, and you could say these even to North America or Europe, you know, the water issues, yes, are differ because of, you know, the watersheds that you have and so forth. But in the end, it really comes down to agriculture and water, right? Agriculture is taking a huge chunk of water. It's not as efficient as it could, should be or could be. Um, and how do we improve that? Um, the other area, of course, is around industrial uses um, and pollution. So we have that from different industrial um, um, production facilities and so forth. How do we manage water quality issues? And then certainly around municipal and drinking water supply, right? How do we get the infrastructure to people um, or for, for basic services, um, whether it's water supply or sanitation, which certainly is also even in California an issue, right? So, um, I'm, gonna, so I'm gonna go with that there is a conflict between agricultural interest and residential interest in California as, as, as part of what the situation, but it's not just specific to California that given the rural, there are rural urban divides and conflicts about who controls water. Is that a, is that a fair statement? I would say it's about allocation of water, right? For what uses is water being allocated for? And that's for any country. There has to be a discussion and decision on, on what purposes is water being allocated for and how do you manage those allocations as demands are increasing, right? So, so I think, I don't know enough about China and water, but I've been told that China has a big water problem. Do you know anything about the China water issues? 
Again, I would say it's pretty much the similar to all the other countries, right, in terms of the same types of issues. There are issues around also managing between gray, green and gray infrastructure, which China has been What's very... That? What's green so and gray? So green infrastructure is using nature to um, basically manage your water system. Um, so there's gray infrastructure, which is traditional infrastructure, and then green infrastructure, um, which is using nature solutions. And so China, but many other countries of the world are looking at how to combine green and gray infrastructure. Um, and so I think this is all something as we move forward are opportunities for innovations as well. So are we going to have future water wars in the future? Are we going to have war, wars over water? <clears throat> Um, I, I, that's been an interesting question that's always pending out there. Um, I, I mean, I'm not necessarily the person to say what will be in the future. There are stresses between water uses, right? We have to just be honest about that. Um, and we have the opportunity to say, particularly how do we bring different water users together to focus on what we term collective action, working together to try and look at these issues together and develop solutions. Um, so there are certainly stress, the risks. I mean, this has been now, as I said, even at the World Economic Forum in Davos, there's quite a bit of discussion around water and the SDGs. How do we tackle these challenges? We had a session on 2030 Water Resources Group there. Um, there were a lot of issues focused around supply chains, you know, how do we tackle these issues. So there's stresses, but I think there's also quite a bit of opportunity for different water users to come together and trying to see how can we solve these problems together. What, what struck me is uh, Ethiopia is building a big dam across the Nile. So you can imagine Egypt's not super happy about that. There was supposedly some kind of a cabinet meeting in the previous Egyptian government talking about how we could blow up the dam with Air Force planes. So I don't think this is like a theoret I think this is not a theoretical thing. And I think this is going to be, I think we're going to see more of this kind of, these sorts of challenges. Like this is a, this is a, you know, I think the Nile is sort of the central to the identity of Egypt and the central to livelihoods of millions of people in Egypt and for all sorts of reasons. So I think we're going to see a whole, I think you could see, I'm not saying we will, but you could potentially see if these aren't managed properly, and I would say if you build a dam and cut off the water to the Egyptians, that's not managing it properly, and or just here's a little trickle, there's they're gonna be a problem. So I think we're gonna see more conflict on water, not less, and I think technology will help us, but I think you know with going to nine billion people and greater urbanization, we're gonna need a lot more planning. Yes, technology matters, but we're gonna need a lot more planning and thinking about it, and we're gonna need a lot more collective action, and we're probably also gonna see a lot more conflict points. We're gonna see conflict points in this country and, uh, and debate, but we're also gonna see potentially real conflict points uh, around the world around water. That's, that's my guess, just after listening to you, Karin. That's my take after I'm here. Okay, so Jonathan, thanks, so, so Jonathan, thanks for being here. Uh, you're the head of inclusive growth and private sector development practice at the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. We were so pleased to have former Prime Minister Tony Blair be our keynote speaker last year at the, the Global Development Forum, and we really appreciate that. I'm a great fan of your, your boss. Um, we wanted to also bring in a conversation about industrialization. So we've talked because the sustainable development goal is industry, innovation, and infrastructure. And so we think it's certainly related to uh, the topics we, that Karin and Peter have been talking about, and it's certainly related to the sustainable development goal. So let's start with industrialization. This is something you work on a lot. And then we can bring in your colleagues, and we can talk about sort of the different issues that have been come up that the three of you have put on the table. Let's go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, I think the, the, with industrialization, and thanks, Dan, for, um, for having me. And I should actually say, before I get going, that I work on our Africa program, so my focus is on our Africa program, and we, um, in our advisory work in Africa, we embed almost about 100 people now in about uh, 14 different countries, um, including Nigeria, Ethiopia, uh, Senegal, Ghana, etc. So a lot of my perspective, I think, would be coming from that, uh, from that, uh, from that angle. 
And I think with regards to industrialization, I think what's fundamentally needed, um, in my view, is looking at um, is, is, is a real uh, partnership and a focus on, on jobs uh, and on job creation, at least looking at it from, a, from an African continental perspective. There are you know, different numbers of how many jobs are needed every year with the population likely to hit, potentially likely to hit 4 billion, up from just over 1 billion in, in 80 years' time, which is not that far away. Um, and the need for, for, for industries uh, not just manufacturing, I'm talking about industries in general, including services, agriculture, etc., which can um, create jobs, and again, not just formal jobs, but also informal jobs and livelihoods, um, is really essential. And what's really needed is uh, using, I think, this SDG, which you know, I would be biased, but argue is um, the most important because it underpins a lot of the ability to del deliver other. So you're going to argue this is the most important one? <laughs> I'm sure everyone does that. That, that is creating a lot. That's fantastic. That's, That's great. A little competition. That's a little competition. <laughs> I thought it was love your neighbor as thyself. Wasn't that what the, the most important? Okay, absolutely. Sorry. Okay, yeah, absolutely. But, uh, but a lot of the, the, so the, 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 the governments and presidents and ministers that we talk to, uh, you know, we go in and provide provide support that is sector uh, agnostic. We'll support you on implementing and driving your agenda into place. And what they're saying is support us on job creation, and they see infrastructure as a key part of that. But it's fundamentally about creating uh, um, industries and sectors that will allow them to deliver three things fundamentally. Jobs and opportunities for the youth and for their people. Um, exports, which allows them to bring in foreign exchange, and tax revenue, which allows them to widen the tax base and then deliver a range of public services, um, and including the development of human capital uh, uh, through that. Um, and so what's really important, I think, is, is, is for us to, you know, the U.S., one of its biggest successes in the development space is PEPFAR, right? Um, and that everyone uh, 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 mentions. We fundamentally need a sort of PEPFAR uh, for, for, for job creation. And using that as sort of a, a way of looking at things holistically and the bigger picture. Because so far, I think part of the challenge is that we haven't really joined the different dots that are necessary to allow, uh, to allow for job creation. And, that's, and job creation, I think, is, is also useful as a tool for um, uh, broader development, what's the development vision of the country as a whole. And so bringing in different elements, how do we plan our, the infrastructure linked into what's going to widen the economy and develop jobs, our trade policy, um, and how it's going to actually uh, really help get these sectors up and running. Um, likewise, our investment facilitation work, which is increasing, uh, and which is the way there's scope to do a lot more. Um, on this point, I think thinking about how we can support uh, and some countries are doing this. Uh, um, Germany, for example, is, is increasingly leading this, trying to see how its big companies, whether it's Siemens and Volkswagen and so on, can set up uh, uh, plants uh, on, on the continent. The US as well, we're seeing some of it, um, but there's scope to do much, much more, not just large companies, but also American um, SMEs as well. And finding those sectors, whether it's textiles and companies like Haynes and PVH are leading on this, that you know, produce you know, Calvin Klein and all these brands have set up in, in, in Ethiopia and are uh, looking also at West Africa at the moment. Uh, John Deere, when it comes to assembly for agricultural equipment, there's a range Mars uh, um, on the agri-food processing side. There's lots of scope to see how we can actually bring these companies in and help develop these economies in a way that empowers uh, and that creates jobs and empowers local SMEs as well. So let's just push a little bit further. I think PEPFAR for job creation, I think that's a really interesting idea. The reason we got PEPFAR and we worked on HIV AIDS wasn't just because we cared about people getting sick. There was some CIA analysis done in the late 90s that said there's going to be potential collapses of countries in Africa and ten, millions and maybe even the tens of millions of AIDS orphans, which is going to create all sorts of un, instability. What I think we've failed to do in sort of the economic, or the job creation, youth employment discussion, that kind of been around it for 20 years, is we've never linked it to the national security yeah. discussion. That, that, that actually, if, you, if, if we don't do this, you're going to have uncontrolled migration. If you don't do this, Young people, young people have four things to do with their energy. They're either going to take a job, they're going to go get education, or they're going to use their energy for unproductive activities. That's the think tank term for terrorism or gangs or militias or, or something bad. Or they're going to migrate. Like that's the four <laughs> things that young people, the young people have energy, they're going to do four things with their energy. You can tell me maybe there's a fifth, but I think that's the typolo Dan's typology of what young people do with their energy is those four things. There's nothing else. So 
we need them, I want them to go through door number one or door number two. I don't want, I'd prefer not number four, and I'd prefer, I sure as heck don't want not door number three. So I actually think it's an interesting idea to have a pepperage for job creation, but before we get there, we have to make a national security argument as to if we don't do this, then door number three and door number four are a lot more likely. Yeah. And I think we've historically not done that because most of the folks in the kind of the youth employment biz are on the happy side of it. And we haven't talked about the unhappy side or scared people enough. And we scared people on PEPFAR. There was an organization, there was, uni there, was a, there was a community of folks who were organized, but there was also like, we scared the heck out of people legitimately. And I think we're gonna have to think about this. If you look at like, there's an enormous demographic tsunami coming. There's gonna be a doubling of young people in Africa, no, doubling of people in Africa. So in 30 years time, there's gonna be more Africans than Indians and Chinese combined. So get your brain around that. There's gonna be more Africans than Indians and Chinese combined. If you look at the Chinese, they're going off a demographic cliff, right? They're going off a big time demographic cliff. And India is just about to kind of hit the top of the curve of the number of folks they're gonna have, and they're starting to drop. So if you look at that and you look at the doubling, 30 years from today, there are, it's a legit argument to say there's gonna be more, and that's a, a lot of young people. And like I said, there's four things they will do with their energy. So if you look at Europe, there's a collective freak out in Europe about Africa in the sense that, not in a, you know, in the sense, what are we gonna do? Are we, what, what if we have mass uncontrolled migration? Now, there's a lot, of, we need to see Africa as a business opportunity. And so I think this industrialization conversation is a good one. If you look at the media coverage on Africa, just look at the New York Times. So if you, re if you read the New York Times, 80%, there was a study done that 80% of articles of coverage in the New York Times on Africa was negative. Think about it, like when was the last time you heard like a happy story about Africa? So it's all, you know, and I won't list all the things, we can word cloud what all the negatives are. So it makes it difficult for folks to see Africa as a business opportunity. Now the Chinese see Africa as a business opportunity and we're stupid if we don't see Africa as a business opportunity. The United States has put $9 billion a year for the last 20 years in foreign aid into Africa. Are we gonna be stupid enough to let the Chinese waltz off with all the upside of the continent? We're dumb if we do that. So we have a national interest angle. We need to see Africa as a business opportunity. There's an enormous class of very talented entrepreneurs in Africa. There's an emerged, not emerging, emerged middle class in Africa. Enormous business opportunity for us, but because of the country brand issues, it's hard in Washington or in many parts of the United States to get a brain around this. That, you agree with that, Jonathan? Yes. <laughs> well, I was gonna say yes, absolutely. Which one do you prefer? Um, no, I think that, 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 is, that is absolutely right. And, and, and I think it's important, there's lots, there's lots of, of, of opportunity and, and potential. Um, and, and this is where you know, the, the world is, 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 is going in terms of that, that drive uh, and dynamism in the future. Um, security issue, I agree, it's there and we're seeing it right now. We just sort of started working in Burkina Faso. And Burkina Faso um, just a year and a half ago was not barely in the news, but now it's in the news because it's overrun um, by, uh, by, by extremists. By extremists. And a big part of that is the lack of eco economic opportunity and also the lack of government uh, footprint in the rural areas um, with Al-Qaeda and so on in, involved there and in other countries in the region. And that's having a huge effect, um, even going further south to the more populated areas in, uh, of, like, uh, of, of southern of Nigeria, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, and so on. So, so I absolutely agree with you on the, on, on the security side of things. Um, I think the thing to also mention is, um, is, is that there's a lot of exciting things happening with, with the US and other countries involved. If you look at the sort of the tech hub in Lagos, um, and there's also other tech hubs um, in other places. Look at the as creative well. economy. I mean, creative the, the economy. The music industry, the film Absolutely. industry. We're going to do one of, one of our panels for the Global Development Forum is the creative economy in Africa, yes. specifically on that. Yeah. yeah. 
Absolutely, um, and Lagos is, is so dynamic and there's so much uh, potential there and economic opportunity, business opportunities there. Um, as I mentioned, uh, um, PVH is one of the companies that has actually been a pioneer in, in, in Ethiopia to help them set up their textiles industry and are currently doing so in, um, and, and working with other American um, and uh, European players to set up in, 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 in West Africa as well. So, but this needs to be scaled up. This basically needs to scale up. But, and that's but you need infrastructure, you need electricity, you need Absolutely. roads, you need ports, you need airports, right? The, to yes. have all that, you need that to have industrialization, But the right? challenge is, the challenge that I would put um, to, my, to, to, to the infrastructure colleagues, which is the same in other areas, whether it's trade, whether it's food security, whether it's education, is we haven't really seen these collectively coming together. And so we've ended up with infrastructure projects here or there. Um, likewise, trade agreements with the Sagoa here or there, but it hasn't really plugged in to the specific needs of industries. What if, we're going, if a car industry, which is happening right now through Renault and Toyota and Volkswagen in Ghana is gonna be set up, what's the, how do you anchor your infrastructure needs specific to that to make sure that car industry is being set up. And I think one of the parallels we should look at is how the US supported countries like Israel, Jordan, um, um, Georgia, excuse me, uh, and others. There, if you look at Israel at the 50s and 60s, the country had their own, the leaders there had a vision for their own country and what they needed to develop based on agriculture fundamentally then, and agro-processing. Um, and a lot of money came in that was channeled through for example, to the infrastructure needs that Israel needed back then, including projects which today we wouldn't really finance. So I'll give you an example. Uh, Ben-Gurion, who was the first prime minister of Israel, once had came up with this crazy plan to build a pipeline from the Sea of Galilee to the Negev Desert, uh, some 200 water. kilometers, water, water pipeline. Um, and many engineers said that's not feasible, but he said, bring me an engineer that will make it feasible. <laughs> And they brought them an engineer that, that said it was feasible and it was built 10 years later. But today, any of the Af our African counterpart leaders come up with such visions, for example, irrigating a million hectares or so on, or building a huge hydro plant dam, but they can't get that type of support because the, the partners are not there to see this 20 year, 30 year vision of where the country is going and, and what it means for actually empowerment of the people on the ground uh, through jobs, through, through education and so on and bringing that all together. So building this sort of 30 year partnerships with, or 40 year partnerships with countries where we're responsive to their vision for their country and the different bits they need on infrastructure, trade, investment, education, um, access to finance, patient capital for SMEs, which is still largely missing on the ground, is really important. So, so John, let me just stop you there. So in some ways, you could argue the SDGs, which I know I complain that there are too many of them, there's 17 of them, and there's 169 sub-indicators. In some ways, many developing countries are trying to use the SDGs as a way of a common language and as a way of trying to look at all the challenges at the same time, right? Is that a fair, is that a fair way to describe it? Yes, so I think, I think that common language point is, is really important, but I think there's also a challenge that I'd like to mention with the SDGs, which, is, um, which would apply also if they're applied here in the US, as we were talking about earlier, which is the sequencing of things, which is a country, especially if you're talking about a country with weak institutions and weak government capability, can't implement all 17 of them at the same time, but yet, inadvertently, there's a sort of this pressure to move on all 17 of them at the same time, rather than saying, no, my priority for my country are these two, Help me with these two. The others, yes, so there's projects and stuff happening, but the really important ones are these two. Measure me on these two, um, because this is the vision for my own country, um, and then we can make progress off the back of that. And that's something I think which we need to, as you say, 17 is a lot, and if you break them down, there's about 150 sub-indicators and goals. But when we come to it from- There's 169 sub-indicators, ridiculous, yeah. too many. But when we come to it from these individual goals, which is how the community, the development community, unfortunately, is organized in a way that leads to that inadvertently, it puts lots of pressure on governments. Um, um, and, and puts, if you're a minister of finance, you're having to sort of choose, do I put money in schools or health or this road? Or, and, and, and thinking through that sequencing as a minister of finance and planning um, is really important. And that's often where the SDG is, I think, um, could be improved a bit. Let me just, two other things I wanted to ask you, and then I want to bring in Karin and, and Peter into this, but what are the trade deals, you've referenced the trade deals, what does the Africa, all African trade agreement mean for industrialization in Africa? And or are there other trade deals that you think are particularly catalytic in helping industrialization happen in Africa? Can you just talk about that? 
Yeah, so from my perspective, I think the, the, the CFTA, I think the Continental Free Trade Agreement is, is really important, um, partly as signaling um, and as giving a clear sense of direction of where African nations themselves want to go. Um, the regional integration, they know that is necessary for industrialization because their markets are uh, um, very, you know, typically small and disconnected for the large part. Um, but I think, it's, I think the bit that they're really trying to emphasize, and that this is something that's common to the global community at large, is we focus a lot on trade, but not focus enough on the industrialization bit, which is what can we actually export, what can we actually produce that will allow us to compete in open markets. And that's the bit which I think has been missing and which the CFTA is trying to bring attention to. Um, how can we actually develop sectors, value chains, whether it's from, you know, soya value chain or whatever value chain it is that countries can be competitive in. Um, and I think the challenge I would put back to, for example, AGOA with respect in here in the US is that it worked it was looked at from the trade angle first rather than the industrialization angle first. We said, yes, trade is important, or agreed, um, but it ended up being a bit of a blanket across all countries rather than taking the industrialization lens of those countries. So an example, it worked well for Ethiopia, which is setting up a textiles industry off the back of it, um, but it worked less well for Malawi, for example, where the sectors they could compete in, they could actually you know, compete in, in an open market in where soya, groundnuts, and so on, but Agoa came in and, oh, you should do textiles, when those countries were saying, but our textile industry crashed 10 years ago and we can't compete in it because we don't have electricity. So we need your help in, uh, in, in soya. We need the access to the markets in soya, for example. So, okay, so it's one other thing, and then I want to open it up so to, to Karen and to, to, to Peter, which is, um, okay, there's been some conflict with China, and also, obviously, in the last six weeks, there's been coronavirus. There's been some shifts in global supply chains in the last 12 months and even in the last six weeks. Are you seeing any, uh, any evidence of that somehow impacting uh, you know, Africa? I'm not going to say it. Is there a potential upside for Africa in all this? Because that, that's perhaps not the right way to say it. But has there been some changes in African industrialization trajectory because of some of these changes in the last six weeks or 12 months? Um, not, not right now. I mean, it's obviously a bit of it's, it's a risk um, from a. Again, if someone cl I close my factory in Wuhan and I open up one in Accra. So not right now. I think um, that hasn't sort of come through as yet. I think that, I think there's more of that discussion happening because of the lead time in terms of the trade war between the U.S. And, and, and China that's potentially opening some interesting opportunities for some countries on supply chains. Um, and I know, for example, Senegal, the government was here a few months ago um, trying to sort of tap into that and say, okay, in terms of you know, production of mobile phones, for example, and other white goods, white manufactured goods, whether it's dishwashers or whatever, to what extent can we, as Senegal being much closer to the U.S., actually uh, tap into that and how can you actually support us to set up these industries? Um, when it comes to coronavirus, um, um, in our experience, that hasn't, we ha we're not yet at that point. We might we'll very well be there in six months' time, but the conversation hasn't arrived to that place yet. Okay, great. Okay, so Karen or Peter, do you want to react to anything either of your colleagues have, have referenced here? I'd welcome you to make any additional comments. Otherwise, I want to open it up to the, to the audience. Uh, just a few quick comments. Uh, what a great conversation, right? And a lot of things, I think, to react to. Uh, I just want to make a couple of comments, one on, on um, China. Yeah, so, uh, Jonathan, you talked about the need for considering industrialization and supply chains in, you know, in the development of infrastructure. And at its root, this is what the BRI initiative is. Mm -hmm. Not every project, obviously, but many projects that China is focused on in the emerging economies include industrial corridors, they include yeah. um, uh, the supply chain needed for uh, Chinese companies uh, to succeed. And, and so you see a lot of compound investment, not just a road, but warehouse facilities, manufacturing facilities, industrial zones, then a port, et cetera. So maybe we're seeing a little bit more kind of concerted push from the Chinese side in that holistic way that you're looking at. It is one of the things we addressed in the report. Dan, and it's something actually the U.S. does well, but we don't do it in a centrally planned uh, kind of focused way that uh, we're seeing uh, from China right now. Um, on, on innovation, um, I thought Karen really talked about a lot of great innovations in the water sector. I have about a, another dozen that I can think of that are, that are incremental. Right, that are not you know, the silver bullet ones, but that have to do with sensors, that have to do with data sets, that have to do with new kinds of innovations and technology that are, that are improving 
existing facilities or access to existing supplies of water or uh, purifying wastewater. So I think it's a combination of things that, that uh, come into play. Um, and then finally, I'll just say that that uh, as both Karen and, and John uh, mentioned, corporations are a huge mover in this mm -hmm. area, right? And we talked about supply chains a little bit, industrialization, but corporations are also focused on the SDGs. And, and they're doing so not just from a corporate social responsibility standpoint, but from a visibility supply chain, transparency in supply chain, from a, from a sense that, that they're getting better results uh, um, from their supply chains and from their operations from being focused around the SDGs. And I think we underestimate the push um, that corporations are making in this space. And, and Chevron is a gr great example because they've sponsored this, um, this program here today. So th those are the kind of three quick things that I wanted to throw out there. Good. Karen. The only thing I just would add is on this question of um, development is, you know, and you're saying, you know, it's a lot of SDGs, but, you know, many countries, as you mentioned, also are looking at these idea of economic zones, right? I mean, the government of Bangladesh has committed to create 100 economic zones. The government of Vietnam is creating economic zones, Ethiopia as well. And so it really provides a, a window of opportunity to look at energy, water, transport, all of these things in a more holistic way um, as the countries are looking at their development plan processes. Yeah. So I think in some respects, it's it's, yes, it's many parts to it, but I think the fact that if you can focus in and bring all these elements together, it can be, you know, create some really gr growth, but then also in terms of benefits from social and environmental benefits as well as looking at through this perspective. Yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah, absolutely, and just building on that point, I think the, the economic zones are a real, I mean, they were an amazing tool in, in, uh, um, in, in China and Vietnam and so on. Um, but they have to be anchored to an industry, to something that's going to bring the money in. And there are, I think there's about 300 of them from between industrial parks and zones across the African continent, but only about 20 uh, have been successful. Um, and that's because they weren't planned and they weren't linked in to, the, to the, this, this holistic planning that, that you're mentioning that allows businesses to go in there and thrive with the access to the different energy um, skills, water, et cetera, that they need. Um, and so using industrial tool zones as a tool for that is important, um, um, as we're seeing in, 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 in some countries now, including Ghana, for example, that has a, one that works well in Tema. Um, and I think, that's what, I think that's what we'd like to sort of increasingly encourage countries like the US to think about is that holistic sort of support and how, and while it's difficult to do central planning, as you mentioned, uh, but increase focus that on, on sort of a bit more responsiveness to the government's own plans for their own vision will allow a bit more coordination of different agencies and also with other countries as well. Say, so, okay, the Germans are doing automotives in Ghana but there's a gap on, I don't know, chocolate manufacturing, which has been a gap for 50 years that everyone said, you know, Ghana, you can't produce chocolate because uh, you're not competitive. And then the Chinese came in and are doing chocolate. And they're doing it. <laughs> um, so that's the type of thing where... Yeah, um, I, I can think of many conversations 15 years ago when I was at AID where American companies would go and lecture the Ghanaians saying they couldn't do that. And it's not true. Yeah. It was wrong. Yeah. And so I agree with you. And I think... Look, I think the Chinese involvement in Africa it should be a healthy wake-up call for us. We have to get with the program, and China sees Africa as a business opportunity, not as a continent to be saved. And we should take a we should take a cue from the the Chinese playbook on that. No, absolutely, absolutely, um, uh, agree, uh, totally agree with that. And I think I think that sort of opens, you know, this sort of. Partnership and a sort of PEPFAR for jobs allows us to work closely with governments and that allows us to see opportunities, but also allows us to see where the constraints are, which if we address them will create even more opportunities. There are many opportunities that we sort of lose uh, because we're not supporting governments um, in, in the right way and we're not diagnosing the problems in the right way. Okay, you've all been a very patient audience. I'd love to hear from you all. They're all well informed. This this person back here, this person, these two folks back here, and this gentleman here. Let's do this. We'll bunch them together. This woman, this woman, and this gentleman here. Please. Good morning. My name is Tim Weichel. Is this on? I think so. Okay. So um, I agree that water shortages. Na name, rank, and serial number, please. Tim Weichel is my name. Thank you. Uh, I agree that water shortages will be an increasing problem in the future. Being from California, I can tell you that water depends on the amount of snowpack and the, the amount of rainfall, which has been decreasing. And we just heard that. There'll be yet another drought this summer and water shortages are going up. Yep. But my question is about water desalinization. So, Karen, uh, in Saudi Arabia, they're pioneering large-scale water desalinization. It's expensive now, but it's working for them. And I'm wondering, is this a realistic 
way to uh, ensure clean water for the future? Great question. Thank you very much. This, this woman here, please. If you could say your name and wh who you're with. Or. Okay. Thank you. My name is Wofai Ibiang. I'm from Johns Hopkins University, just right in the corner. And um, speaking about infrastructure, I don't think you can actually speak about infrastructure without talking about financing. So my question is for Peter. Uh, there have been like um, innovations in terms of um, financing instruments. So my question for Peter is, what does he think about um, green bonds as investment um, mechanisms? And does he think that it will be sustainable? very much. And then this gentleman over here, please. Hello. My name is Abolaji. I'm originally from Nigeria. I'm an Atlas Core Fellow here, um, Seven with Making Sense International. Uh, my question is, um, um, aid, aid um, is becoming political, and then is that positive or is it negative? And I'm sorry, what's becoming political? Aid. Like USAID, for example, providing aid to um, oh, development. foreign assistance. Yeah, foreign oh, yes, assistance. Okay, yep. It's becoming political, and is that is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? And don't you think um, uh, international development organizations and international governments um, should condition such aids or foreign assistance um, on the capacity of the developing countries or governments to be able to meet the infrastructural needs before these aids are, or investments are, uh, are then channeled to them? I hope you got my question. It's a bit lengthy. Good. Okay. okay, let's start with the water. Karen? Um, yeah, thank you for your question. I think um, when we're looking at water, I mean, it's really, as I mentioned before, is looking at all the different water uses and then trying to determine which are the solutions that make the most sense for a particular country and factoring in energy costs and all those aspects. I mean, we actually, within the 2030 Water Resources Group, have, as I mentioned, have been really focusing on this promoting circular economy approaches, right? There's a lot of potential there for treating wastewater and reusing it that is, in essence, untapped. Um, and so it's, I think, with the desalination, it's kind of in that mix of options that are there for governments to look at. Um, certainly we see with private sector though, because um, private sector companies in themselves are also putting in wastewater treatment into their own operations and to seeing how then that could be traded among different companies and in industrial parks, for example, in the economic zones. So I think it's looking at all the different options, taking a look at what the projections are in terms of water supply gap um, for within, within a particular country and then assessing you know, where it could be perhaps efficiencies in agriculture use and so forth. So just to depends on kind of what are the priorities for the economy of a particular country and then where could be the most um, viable options in terms of looking at um, water and water management and also the financing options. Green bonds. Um, I, think it's a, I think it's a really interesting um, point. Green bonds have emerged over the past decade and they have a growing audience and um, uh, capacity. But, but underlying that, you still have to have a viable business that you're lending the money to and you're getting a return on that green bond for. So if green bonds become, um, or any investment, right, it doesn't prove that it can repay the, the money that has been raised, then the attractiveness of, the, of that investment is going to decrease. So some of the fundamentals still have to be addressed in terms of what is the underlying business model, how is that money going to get repaid, et cetera. But one of the things that I think has been most interesting about green bonds is that they're, it's kind of a, a supply side capital push that is forcing new business models to emerge around um, green infrastructure or green investments uh, in a way that I don't think would have happened uh, as quickly previously. So some of those are, there's an interesting one right here in Washington, D.C., for example, around, um, around uh, uh, stormwater runoff um, and using natural uh, green uh, stormwater runoff systems versus the gray stormwater runoff systems and the trade-off and cost between those two. So I think we're seeing kind of some interesting innovations emerge, but we'll see how big that market gets over time. But it is, it is an instrument that can be used for infrastructure if properly structured, yeah. Good. Jonathan, you want to take this issue of fluidization of assistance? Yes, um, I'll take the first question. The second one, I'll just come back to you because I didn't manage to understand it. But on the first question, I think, um, I mean, uh, the, the, the theory would go that ideally you want it to be depoliticized, um, aid for assist, foreign assistance to be depoliticized. But the reality is that development is a political process. It's not a technical process. And I think that 
while you definitely need some degree of, of, of technical independence um, in there, um, ultimately there's always geopolitical interests lurking you know, behind the scenes and, and driving things behind. And, and when we've seen most examples of this sort of long-term partnership between a country and another to sort of uplift countries, whether it was, you know, Japan supported um, Brazil a lot in developing its its Cerrado, its agriculture, getting its agriculture yeah, transformation. That was a 20-year that was a 20-year project, and it right. created a second airplane engine of agricultural development in Brazil. They had one airplane engine in the Pampas, and they separated a second one in the Cerrado, which was sort of a non-usable agricultural right. land. It took 20 years to do it, and that was a political exercise because Japan was looking for an alternative food food security source basically away from China at the time. If we look at Europe with regards to Eastern Europe, you know, its investment into Poland and so on. Yeah. The US with Georgia and in not, you know, 10, 15 years ago, Israel, as I mentioned before. But this is when we've seen that sort of alignment of interests, uh, geopolitical interests, that it went beyond just five-year projects that are sort of designed in this box to actually how we're actually going to sort of uplift the whole country and transform the whole country and the whole economy. And that's, I think, why, in my view, I think it's really important yeah. that we, that it's important for the politics to be more upfront so it can actually yeah. be debated rather than beneath yeah, the table. Yeah, we, we do all assistance since the Marshall Plan has been done out of enlightened self-interest. We did the Marshall Plan because of the Czechoslovakia coup of 1948. There was a complete collective freakout in Washington. There were 100 congressional delegations, not 100 members of Congress, 100 congressional delegations to go to Western Europe to understand the, the danger and the challenge of having uh, a takeover of Western Europe by the communists. And so Richard Nixon, in his first term as a member of Congress, went to Italy. Members of Congress were not allowed to bring spouses, and they were not allowed to bring tuxedos for evening wear. So they were supposed to, they were there to work. Scared the hell out of them. They, and so the leadership in the Congress said, we need to scare the hell out of the American people if we were going to actually do foreign assistance, because they were skeptical about foreign assistance. So as I said earlier, I think PEPFAR was something we did. Yes, there's a coalition of folks who are always going to show up out of the goodness of their heart, but it's not. To ta totally it now, if, and if one thinks that the Chinese are in Africa because they're doing this out of the goodness of their heart, I think we're all kidding ourselves, right? So they got a neo-colonial attitude, if you ask me, about how they're approaching Africa. I'd like to think I think Africa will miss the United States, and you know I think is one of the reasons we're being asked to come back is because I think we we don't have a we don't I don't think we have operate in a neo-colonial way. I think the Chinese do. And I think we bring values, I think we bring standards, I think we bring, we, we try, we're not perfect, but we try and bring rule of law and we, we bring issues of corruption. And so I think there's a, so I think we, you know, so I think we've always operated from a place of enlightened self-interest. And so I think, you know, I think we just need to, I think Jonathan's right, I think we need to be more upfront about it. And I think sometimes we kind of, you know, kind of pretend it's not there, but I think it's there. like infrastructural developments? Well, I think we've always had conditionality. We have different kinds of conditionality. Like, are you meeting certain human rights standards? Are you, are you stealing blindly from your society? Are you, so I think it kind of depends. And so I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think it kind of depends on what the country is and what the context is and some conditions. I think, I think also what your options are. If you can take your business to the Chinese, whether our leverage on our conditionality is less strong than it used to be. I don't think we got the same ability to kind of dictate terms that we did 30 years ago. And also, I think our theory of change has changed. I think we're the, I think foreign aid, whether it's multilateral or bilateral, I think we still operate as if that's the largest wallet in the room. It's not the wa largest wallet in the room. There's private sector money, there's diaspora money, there's local savings. Lot, there's been a quintupling of taxes collected in Africa since the year 2000. And there's been increasing amounts of co developing countries and African countries spending their own money on their own development. So we're a much smaller, we're, a, we're the ta tail wagging the dog, but we often as a conceit and sort of as our theory of change operates as if we're still the largest wall in the room and we're not. So for us to dictate terms is, is I think we need to have a little bit of humility about what we can do and what we can dictate. That would be my take. Okay, last question from this gentleman over here. Thanks. Um, on the topic of, um, of, of private investment and, uh, and, and the like, um, are you seeing more trends towards demands of current return or sooner return, particularly in, in ESG, which was you know, viewed as a little bit more of, a, um, of impact, but I think some of the professional investments want current return and real return on this versus viewing it as a charity? 
So um, if I understand the question, the question was, um, do we see that there is a differential in return expectations between ESG financing and standard financing? Yeah, it's both yield and also in, ter in terms of time. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure we can lump all of the ESG investment in one bucket. There are certainly a group of investors who have a lot of patience and are willing to take a lower return to see the um, ESG benefits come to fruition. Then there are other, let's say, investors who would like to put their money to work in ESG functions as long as it's competitive with you know, other places where they can invest their money. And um, you know, I don't have the data to hand on how big which group is, but I think you know, both groups are essential to um, driving the innovation that I was talking about earlier uh, and expanding that market. But there's definitely a group of investors that you know, are, are more patient and willing to take lower returns. Um, but I think the larger market is if you can introduce ESG investments that are competitive with non-ESG investments in terms of uh, duration and return. All right, we need to end it here. Please join me in thanking the panel. This was great. Thank you very much.